to the time. Uh, so we talked about node, then there is uh, Kubernetes master. Okay, this is like the, uh, as I mentioned, it's like the, they are, everything is handled at the end. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we uh, we have this great tool called Cube Control. Uh, let me share my screen. So right now what I'm doing is I am running a Kubernetes cluster in my machine. It is not a production ready cluster, but something that we can test off. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, when you are running a cluster, there are like three things that we need, uh, three machines at least, the master and the two working node. So it is like very, very low end uh, two nodes are running in my machine. So, so one thing that I can do is uh, I have, uh, I think I haven't shared my screen, right? Let me share. Google Chrome. Okay, so uh, within uh, within my terminal, if I have Kubernetes everything installed and configured, I can say cube control. Then it it says okay, cube control is here, and we we have like a lot of things uh, that we can do and we can uh, work with. Okay. So it's giving me just a bunch of idea, bunch of uh, suggestions that we that I need to do. Okay. So first thing that uh, most of the time when we when we get uh, uh, get into a Kubernetes environment, we can say Kubernetes control get pods. Uh, yeah. So uh, if I say Kubernetes control get pods. That means that I'm trying to uh, connect to my Kubernetes cluster and trying to get run, running, uh, uh, trying to get all the running pods. Okay, right now I do not have any pods. And as I mentioned earlier, Cube Control is a tool that we use uh, to communicate uh, or to use to uh, make connection with Kubernetes cluster. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have more of a GUI way of doing these things. Okay, if you uh, most of the time uh, for smaller tasks, something that we can manage, we can use uh, what we call Kubernetes uh, dashboard. Okay, so this is like uh, something that you would see if you are working with the Kubernetes cluster. This is probably the GUI way of doing these things. Okay, so. It looks like a lot, okay, and uh, and and it is it is a lot of things uh, compared to uh, what we have seen uh, throughout uh, our application. So this particular uh, UI, the GUI that you are seeing, uh, the uh, UIC that you are seeing in here, is called a dashboard. Okay, this is also a Kubernetes uh, pod that we are running. Okay, so this is something that you will see. So under here, the, the uh, you will find some of the things that we have talked, like pods. Okay, you can see pods in here. So there are, there are no running pods at this moment. We don't have any pods that we are running. Uh, but of course, we can get uh, a tour, like how we can uh, start uh, something like running a simple pod okay pod definition how we can do that we'll get into that thing uh, in a little bit so you guys can see there is pods uh, sorry there is pods there is replica set and much more things that we haven't uh, talked okay so we know services there are no services running and there are like ingress uh, so we will talk about these things in, in much uh, smaller details okay not every, not big Okay, so uh, right now, uh, uh, right now my uh, Kubernetes cluster is basically an empty. Okay, I, I don't have anything uh, that that I can run or work with. So what I can do is uh, with the uh, with this dashboard, uh, I can uh, I can find more more of. Uh, 
uh, other things that uh, that I can do. Like if you guys can remember, we have Docker, uh, uh, the basic idea behind uh, the Kubernetes cluster is to run Docker images, right? We need to manage uh, um, uh, uh, we need to run some things uh, in, in our application. So how are we going to do that? Uh, it's simple. I will uh, show you guys very, very simple uh, uh, application. And um, there is uh, nothing afterwards. Okay, we, uh, we are not going to do uh, anything uh, crazy uh, because it's too much at this point even. Okay. Uh, run nginx let me give um let me see with what I can find simple simple pod that I can run. Okay, uh, one thing that I am going to do is uh, let's go to the Kubernetes cluster and using kube control uh, get not. So you guys can see that I am uh, having a single not kube control get not. That means I am running in a one single not. You guys can see it is running on Docker desktop. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, to do a production application, uh, one uh, uh, one uh, node would be enough. You need more than three nodes to be running. But for demonstration purposes and you know whether we are working, uh, we can say that uh, uh, it's like working, right? So next thing that I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to be running uh, a simple uh, um, a simple um, uh, image uh, image running okay I will deploy a, an a image that will be running on Kubernetes cluster so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, take this command just let me okay so I am gonna be running a simple uh, simple hello world application okay so hello world uh, kind of a pod so i'm using cube control and it's run command okay and what i'm gonna uh, use is uh, a pod okay as i mentioned earlier in in our uh, in in uh, kubernetes the smallest point of deployment is going to be a pod my pod is going to be named test and what i'm going to do is um Pass some argument, restart never. That means I'm not going to uh, restart if it is existing. Okay. That means if I had the pod running, I'm not going to uh, make much of, much of a hiss. And uh, the next thing is the image. Okay. So this is like the basic Docker image that we will need. So I'm going to be uh, using the hello world docker image this is like the smallest docker image that you will find it's going to just echo hello world and um, that's it okay and uh, minus it you guys can remember that is interactive terminal that's that's it okay and uh, what i'm going to do is uh, using kubernetes i'm going to run this command okay now the image uh, which which if, if I had this uh, if I had this image it uh, it will be uh, it will be shown but if I if, if now if not uh, it will say it will download the hello world image and it will work okay so you guys can see 
uh, uh, this is like the uh, basic hello world uh, application right now remember we did not use docker to run but we run using Kubernetes. Okay, so we, we created a pod call test and use the image. Okay, this is the image that we are using. So this should this is available in Docker Hub. Okay, if it is not in the Docker Hub, you need to specify the repository as well. But right now the Hello World application is there. So if I uh, clear this up now and say cube control get pods, okay. Now you guys can see that there is a pod call test since I have uh, I have uh, deployed it and it is in ready state and status is completed. That means it is all no longer there and we have no restarts and the age of it, it is like 20, uh, sorry, 62 seconds ago. I have, uh, uh, I have um, running it for like 20, uh, 62 seconds at this point okay so if i go to the same thing with the kubernetes dashboard if i go to pods oh, weird um, let's see it's not showing something uh, i okay yeah i have a lot of errors coming in that might be the case let me try to restart the uh, proxy that might be the case, yes. Kubernetes control proxy. Yeah, I think apparently on batch for the new system. Yeah, I think the dashboard is not configured correctly. Let me check that I have to. Uh, Change my permissions. Kubernetes mm -hmm. dashboard. I don't want any configuration to the cube control proxy. Okay, now it is proxy. Yes, still skewing like a bunch of errors. Uh, probably. Yes. Yeah. Dashboard is a little bit of broken. I'm not sure why. It might be something related to the configuration things that I have done earlier on. Uh, da, 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 da. yeah that's let's, let's uh, just keep uh, keep stick to the cube control so you guys can see that i have cube control get ports it is running one single port at this moment uh, it's called test and it, it has uh, this amount of uh, applications uh, and it is running as expected, okay? So in order to run another one, like uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, um, if I want to run another uh, application, uh, something else, what we can, what I can do is I can use the cube control apply command, okay, to run something and Minus F represent the file that we want to write, and it's going to be always a YAML file. Yeah, so it can be in my local machine, it can be on the internet. Uh, however, I, if I provide this YAML file and using the cube control apply and giving the file, I can uh, deploy a application in Kubernetes. Okay, so this is like the sample YAML file. Okay. It is something similar to a Docker Compose file, but not the exact, exactly thing. So it is something that we need to know, okay? So 
uh, we are using the uh, API version one and kind, what kind of things that we are deploying in here. We will be deploying a namespace. Okay, so like pod services and ingress and outgress, everything. This is going to be a namespace. This is namespace is like a group of uh, things that we're going to do. And metadata, these are like the metadata that we are going to give and it's going to be Kubernetes dashboard. So this is like label that we have given and uh, the, uh, the name that we have given is Kubernetes dashboard. Okay, so this is one uh, deployment and the next one we'll be creating uh, another deployment. You guys can see that with uh, three dashes in, in here, we can separate uh, deployment. We can have these in multiple files, but if we, if we are deploying these things in one single file, what you need to do is uh, separate them via dashes. So we have API version. Okay, this is the version that we are referring and kind, what kind of uh, application or what kind of, uh, what kind of thing that we are trying to deploy. So Earlier we deploy a namespace. Now we are deploying a service account and the metadata is related to this. These are the labels that we are going to be using names and namespace. What are the namespace that we are using? So you guys can see the namespace that we referred here is using in this service account itself. And next thing that we will be using is uh, uh, API version one and we'll be deploying a service, okay? So you guys can see we are using labels and under the same label, we are we are having uh, Kate apps and Kubernetes dashboard. And we have the same namespaces and metadata. So these are like how we gonna know, how we gonna intercommunicate with uh, the application itself. And you guys can see there is uh, spec. These are like more of uh, outside world in uh, how we interact with the outside world. There is ports, so there is uh, within the port uh, 4883, which within the pod uh, will be mapped to 443. So that's kind of the idea behind that. And there is something like secret. So this is like something uh, something that you guys uh, know, like pods, we can, uh, I, I mentioned like we can store some configurations, okay, some uh, uh, configuration related to secrets. So we are um, we are creating a secret, and we uh, we uh, we create in the type of opaque uh, token. Okay, and same goes to another secret. We have opaque, but data is like empty. And we have another uh, secrets, and we have a configuration map. Which is like a seek, which is like configuration, but you can see it um, or without uh, encryption or decryption happening. So these secrets you can't see, but configuration maps you can see with without any uh, without any configurations. And there are roles. Of course, we are not gonna look into all these things. And there are cluster roles. Uh, role bindings, uh, cluster role bindings. And one important thing is the deployment. So this is where like the deployment happens and uh, the version, API version and some metadata to link each other. And this is like the fun part. So how many replicas we need when you are deploying this uh, revision history limit, how much history that we will uh, select and the selectors these are all connected to the pods and everything and the template and what kind of containers that we will be using the container name is kubernetes dashboard and uh, the image that we will be using this uh, and how we're going to get the image we always going to pull and what are the uh, I, uh, what are the uh, ports that we can expecting and like some of the other configurations that we will need to pass on Okay, so a special thing in here deployment, how many replicas do we need? So if I say one replica, that means Kubernetes deployment will only create one instance. And if that goes down, there'll be another one. Okay, so if I had 10 replicas, it will create uh, 10 of those things. And if one goes down, another one spin up. So all together replication count will be 10. Okay. And there are like services which will gonna expose these things support 8,000 and 
list goes on okay so there are like a lot of things that uh, probably it will be too much for you guys at this point but remember this is like a basic uh, kubernetes uh, deployment structure okay so i know it's it's kind of quite a lot but remember when you learn these things it's quite simple okay all you need to know is these different kinds of services available services pod replication controllers and that's that's it okay so you guys have a basic idea around this uh, and in order to run this file all i had to do is say kubernetes uh, cube control apply the file the file that i'm interested in okay if i execute this and it will do is it will create the namespace it will create the service all the things that I have done, I, I instructed in there, will be one by one executed and everything uh, will be uh, shown in here. Okay. And uh, if I go to the dashboard itself right now, I think, yeah, it's not working. I need to proxy it. Yeah, still I think yeah. I am not un or oh, I'm not authorized to run. Um uh, this dashboard. And these are the service. Yeah. In edit credentials, so I don't have the access sign in. Uh, so the configuration files, I don't have that. So I need a token to be represented, but I think I can skip. Kubernetes. I'm going to do a In here, I think I have to go to script. Okay, namespace, dashboard. I need to add one record in here. This is like mumbo jumbo to you, the perfectly fine. Uh, Right access. Uh, uh, if I can patch this. Okay, patched. Now I can proxy. Maybe it drops it out. Yeah, if I skip it, what happens is I don't get the I don't get everything that I need. Yeah. Okay. But most of the time you will get something, uh, some sort of um uh, UI, <laughs> UI kind of this, okay? But if you are unable to get in like me, you know, what you can do is, uh, let me check me, me, okay, as dashboard token. Mm -hmm. Mm 
think I can get the token. I don't have a token, so sorry about that. But anyhow, uh, so I briefly show what the dashboard is going to look like. Most of the time, you you guys will develop your application in uh, not in uh, your local machine, but for testing. But when you are running your application, it's going to be uh, something like uh, um, something like uh, what we call uh, uh, something like uh, Google uh, Google. Uh, Google Authentication or uh, Google GCP, Google Cloud Manager. That's kind of place that you will be uh, working with, okay? And most of the time, uh, this will just do. Uh, so you guys, you guys need more information. Just, um, just work on these things as is, as it is, okay? Uh, da da da. So I'm trying to get a workaround in here. Sure. Code here. Sorry. Okay, the D dot yellow. I'm gonna do a quick thing so that I can check. So what I'm gonna do is do control and apply minus F D dot yellow. Okay. Check if I can get the admin token. Got it. Copy. Let's see. You control. Oops. The uh... Okay, I got it finally. So I need to be like log in uh, in a proper way. Uh, so if you guys do not get it, uh, that's completely fine. But I just managed to get uh, into my uh, pod. So you guys can see I have one pod running. Okay, so if I click on it, you guys can see the information regarding that pod and condition, how all those things, IP address and blah everything that related to this pod okay what are the containers what is the image that we are running okay a mounting path and a lot of things and uh, we created uh, some of the secrets uh, config map configuration maps so these are like the configuration maps 
that we have created these are like open things but if i create something uh, secret they will be showing in, in here we have another space yes so they are like namespaces uh, which is like all the other things that we have so uh, i have changed uh, the namespace to kubernetes dashboard so the dashboard is running on a different namespace in the namespace, you guys can see the certain files which I'm not having authorized. Um, so I have like secrets and uh, these secrets are like, we, I can't see these things. These are like, you guys can see these mumble jumble. You can't see anything clear, okay? So these are like encrypted within the Kubernetes system that I can't see. But if I go to config map, I can see some of the data uh, if they are like enabled, you guys can see that in config map, I can clearly see the uh, certificate that we have installed. So CA certificate can be seen. So that's the difference between the configuration map and a secret. Secret, you can't see, everything is encrypted. Either you don't have access to that. So uh, within this namespace, within the dashboard namespace, if I go to pods, you can see like a lot of pods are running. Within this pod, you will see a lot of containers, okay? So the uh, Kubernetes dashboard is running this Kubernetes UL dashboard uh, that is used for uh, seeing these things. And there are like other things, the services, as I mentioned, these are like the services and within the IP address that we have, okay? I'm not gonna go to what are the node IP, cluster IP and all those things. If you guys really into uh, learning Kubernetes, you will write, get to know these things like what of what are what do you understand by uh, cluster IP and a node IP and it, um, uh, those kind of things okay and one special place that I would like to go is like the, the, I'll go to default namespace uh, so I have uh, like one uh, pod running okay so I don't have any replication sets in here so that means um, this application is running only one time and it is running afterwards. No replications are happening, okay? So no restart have happened. Uh, this kind of basic information that uh, I would get, that's it. And then, uh, but in other namespaces like Kubernetes dashboard, there will be replication controllers, replication sets, okay? I can say, uh, that zero pods are running, but in here, one out of one pods is running for the uh, dashboard. Okay, so the uh, pod status, we are running one spot and desired is also one. That means we wanted one pod and that one is running. Say for instance, if you want two, uh, if you want uh, desired two and if it is running one, the replication set would always uh, try to get the amount of running components to the desired component size. So that is something that you guys should know when we are working with them. So we have uh, the pods, we have the services that is allocated to that. So just remember these words at least so you guys know what, uh, what Kubernetes is all about, okay? Uh, do not uh, like uh, try to uh, remember everything that you will see here that at least have an idea there is something called Kubernetes and it has these concepts like pods, replication sets, services, ingress and outgress. So one day, if you if you really want to go into configurations and deploying a, a huge large scale application, uh, that you, you guys won't be surprised to learn everything. Okay, so you guys have a little bit of knowledge. Uh, okay, uh, there is... There are certain things that we need to know. Yes, of course, that is something. But at the end, you can uh, manage it uh, without a huge issue, okay? And there are like deployments happening. Uh, and yes, like a lot of things going on. Some, this, uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem, it is changing rapidly, so even some some features, some uh, things even I do not have access to. Okay, I mean, I, it's pretty much easily someone can get outdated if you don't know what they are working with. Okay, 
So basically, remember board services, namespaces, uh, config map, secrets, that's kind of things, what they are for and what uh, their role is going to be, what is or not, that kind of thing. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on roles, service accounts, and those things. So these are like complex tasks, if I may say. So cron jobs, uh, demon sets, deployments. Um, you, have, you know the words if you were really interested to learn those things. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we can do this. Um, the UI, of course, it helps. But uh, most of the time, uh, we will be using cube control uh, and to see what are the ports. Okay. Cube control get uh, services. Uh, services. Okay. So you can see what are the services that is run. So by default, it is, uh, it is connecting to the default namespace, this one. But if I want, uh, let's say, for example, I want to go Kubernetes dashboard. This is the namespace. And you can see there are like two uh, ports running. Okay. But if I say Kubernetes control ports, it is going to show me the default port. So if I want to change uh, uh, the namespace, I need to give as a variable. Uh, it says cube. Kubernetes dash board. Yes. So I I can uh, I can uh, give the namespace. Okay, which namespace I want to see in uh, pods. So it's gonna be uh, passing the name of the dash uh, of the uh, namespace that we are interested in. So now you guys can see there are two uh, pods running. Uh, that is gonna be really easy to figure out. Okay, uh, so make sure. Uh, you guys know Kubernetes at least the uh, at least the commands. Uh, so we know for sure uh, that uh, everything is working. So Kubernetes get pods and the namespace that we are interested in. Just hit enter, you will see everything. So the same thing, same thing uh, you will see uh, in the UI as well. Okay. All right. So. Um, so I'm not going to go uh, beyond this point, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of like, uh, trying to, uh, explain you guys all the things, uh, that we, that we, um, uh, that we are trying to, uh, go within Kubernetes. Okay. But just to have an idea that Kubernetes is there and how and where and why we use it. Okay, all uh, right. Uh, 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 uh. Mm, okay. Uh, one thing that I need to... Uh, One thing that I need to do is C four 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 to go search. Okay. Uh, so uh, within the course content that I'm, I'm just looking at anything that we have missed or anything that uh, we need to talk uh, further. Okay. Uh, so topic one, we was uh, we were supposed to. Uh, talk about revision controls. Uh, we worked on that one as, and we worked on um, release management, how we're gonna do releases. That's uh, the tools that we have used so far, Docker, Kubernetes, those kind of things are related to re uh, release management. 
and we have uh, looked in configuration management tools uh, such as uh, environment variables, uh, Docker config, Mac secrets, that's kind of thing. We have looked into those things as well. That's good. And build process, including automation, testing, and continuous integration. So we uh, look about continuous integration. Um, continuous integration in the sense we use the GitHub pipeline and all those things. And we need to uh, work on uh, automation, test automation. So we'll uh, focus on test automation uh, going forward, what, what we need to do. And software configuration management processes, we looked into these things uh, in terms of uh, how we're going to do management, how we're going to do source cost management, how we're going to do deployment, that kind of things. Uh, maintaining issues and distribution and backup. Uh, so we talked about uh, we talked about uh, maintenance. Uh, sorry, uh, we did not talk about maintenance and distributions and backup. We will uh, uh, go uh, ahead with uh, those two topics. That is maintaining issues and distributions, and how are we going to do backups. This kind of things. Okay, that's going to be good. Uh, so we have talked about continuous integration. Um, and we talked uh, we talked about uh, uh, continuous integration. Now we will integrate uh, testing or uh, section uh, testing sections into our applications. Okay, so we have a little bit of time, so we will uh, work on these things. We will just discuss. Uh, let me put the course content just in case, so you guys don't forget. Software configuration management. Yeah. So these are the topics that we need to discuss. So one thing that I'm going to talk in here is uh, the next uh, topic that I'm going to talk is uh, related to testing. OK, uh, so anyone in here, uh, anyone in here have uh, written a software? Raise your hand. I have written a software. At least hello world that is continued considered as a uh, software. Anyone? I have written a software. Of course, you should by now at least. Nobody. Okay. Sahan. What about others? Okay, Andika has written. So Mitra, maybe Sarah, okay. Nice, okay. So, yeah, nice. So uh, I want to know who here have written a test case against it. How are we gonna write a test case? I have written a test case for my application. Okay, nobody. Anybody taking last of us? Anyone have written a test case against? Well, then I uh, I should say, guys, uh, you guys have done uh, half of the job. Okay, that means uh, writing uh, software is okay. Yes, that that should be done, but in other other sections, uh, you guys should write. Uh, test cases. So anyone knows why do we write this? As a developer, uh, anyone knows why do we need to write test cases? Why? Why? Uh, if the code is working, it is working, right? Why do we need test cases? What's the uh, idea behind uh, writing a test? Anyone have? Yes, any idea? Sahan? Bim Sara? Palpani? Varuna? Any ideas? Why do we need a test case? Yes? Just give me an idea. Just go ahead. You don't have to be exactly perfect. 
Why do we need a test case in, in, in the first place? To verify the functionality of the code is working correctly. Okay, yes. To check rows of pair act to different outputs. Yeah, input outputs, I think, what you mean. Yeah, inputs. Yeah. So yes, uh, the problem is we are complete we are constantly evolving with rows of tests, right? We always add codes, we always remove codes, we do new features, we do bug fixes. Whatever we're gonna do, we're gonna be changing our code. Okay. The, we will be changing our code and what whatever lies with it. So um as a developer, uh uh, works well explosive testing is impossible yeah so as developers uh, we should know that when we are when we are writing code it is uh, quite oftenly uh, when we fix somewhere some 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 place if the code base is huge if there are a lot of things going on in the background probably we are going to break somewhere else Okay, we will be probably going to be building, uh, will be uh, breaking somewhere else. So, what's the reason? What is the uh, reason that when we are fixing something, that something goes wrong? Well, probably the issue is with software is that uh, once we focus on a feature, once we focus on a bug, we do only think to get that part done. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's say, for example, if uh, if you want to fix a bug and the bug says, okay, the uh, the text should be in red, uh, but now it is in blue, we will find a way to make it red and we would probably break, uh, we would probably not think why it was in blue at the first place, okay, why it was in the blue in the first place, as long as uh, we get everything into red. Then what we'll do is we will consider the bug is fixed. Okay. But there can be more and more use cases. In the first place, the button was in blue for some reason. Okay. Uh, maybe it was another feature that uh, that have included. Sometimes another developer has done a similar kind of feature that was not documented. We don't know why it is going on. So anyhow, uh, the changes that we do can break someone else functionality code or some uh, somewhere else to prevent that to make sure that we are not breaking someone else code or even our own code or even the functionality we should what we should do is we should make sure that uh, we introduce some sort of verification by applying our fix by applying our code section into this uh, new component, new uh, new software line of code, we are not breaking an existing one, okay? So that verification uh, can be achieved by doing uh, two things. First thing is there should be a well-known person uh, or a well-known documentation that describe the same component. Say for example, the blue text that I mentioned, Okay, so we can say the text is turning blue if a certain value is uh, is passed. If it is more than 100, it is turning blue. If it is more than 200, it's going to be red. Okay, that is clearly mentioned. And we know, ah, okay, this is the reason why it is uh, going in that way. So we know we won't be breaking the code. And sometimes uh, uh, these documentations are missing. Okay, sometimes the documentations are not there. We don't know a reason. It's just turned blue as we know it. It was turning blue all the time. So we, we don't care, it is there. So that kind of uh, thing is not gonna work uh, within a production level application. So we need to make sure that either those things are document, the reason behind this document, or what we need to do is we need to make sure that uh, a person is testing these things out regressively. Okay, so for instance, there is a QA person. He knows. Ah, okay, uh, 
if if you are dealing with this component, okay, at 100, it should be blue, at 200, this should be red, he knows everything. So we can uh, give a, 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 a different person or a, a physical person to make sure that this is working as expected. We did some changes in, in this code section. So I, we can instruct the other person, make sure we, we have done some changes here, make sure the existing functionality is not broken and the current functionality is working as expected. We can instruct a certain person to do so. Uh, we have done changes, make sure that is not broken. But the problem in most of the time is sometimes even when we do a certain change on one component, sometimes totally unrelated component can break somewhere in somewhere else. Okay, that is happening all the time. Believe me when I say, if you have a lot of dependencies, a lot of chaining things going on, it might happen. Okay, 90% of the time it happens. So we even though we instructed a person, okay, you check this component, we have uh, done some changes in here. Now it might be broken or it might be changed. Can you check upon it? That person will do the same thing, but he is he or she is not aware of a certain other place is broken by this. Okay. So in order to avoid that, what we can do is we can't always uh, come up with these excuses. I have changed here, but it is breaking somewhere else. We don't know what will happen. So our code will gradually become very unstable because we don't, we have a large code base. Now we can't test it. Okay. To overcome this, to overcome this, what we do is when we write a certain section of our code, we write a test case. Normally, as a developer, that is something I say it is a must. Okay, writing code that is a programmer. A software engineer always should write the code and the test cases. Okay, they should be in doing engineering to make sure those things are working. A programmer can, you know, they can find a piece of code on Stack Overflow or ask a GTP to write and they can paste it. And the uh, the developer is responsible uh, to write, to make sure that, ah, okay, if something in the future changes, this will not break. Okay, the functionality will remain even whatever Happen. But believe me, it is like not a bulletproof situation. It's not like a silver bullet by writing test cases. I'm not going to say this is going to be 100% completely uh, going to be surviving throughout the software. No, it's not. But at least we have like closure saying, ah, okay, this has done test cases. We have tested this is out on some rare occasions. Yes, it might break. Rare occasions, okay, not all the time. But on some certain uh, situations, this might break. So you guys can see that in 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 our applications, sometimes when we uh, when we work on certain things, the application might go uh, wrong. Okay, so uh, manual testing is. It is there for certain things, but it is not going to be sufficient for everything. So we need to introduce automation or automated test. Okay. So what do you understand by test and automation, test automation? So we know as we write a code, uh, we write some sort of test. So any kind of test that you guys are familiar with, at least heard about it. I have heard about this test and this test. Anyone knows any test types? I mentioned unit test. Yes. Any other type of test that you guys know? What are the other kind of tests? Integration testing, correct. Yes, integration testing is one of the things. System testing, yes, that is correct. We test the whole system. What else? 
functional testing yes component level testing correct yes so there are different type of tests happens all over the time okay all over the time we have blackboard testing <clears throat> we have white box testing we have end to end testing we have floor testing you can name it whatever you want so in in theory uh, in a application in a software application what a programmer should or a developer should uh, or a software engineer that should look into there are three different kind of tests that we mainly should focus on okay these are like things a developer should write so first kind of test is as i mentioned unit test okay that is a must uh, what we should write unit test on smaller smaller functions classes and those kind of things then we need to focus on other kind of tests like integration test okay we had to think about integration test integration test is like uh, in, uh, it is a test that running against like a smaller two functions or smaller uh, smaller group of individuals coming together and working so unit test is like most of the time when we are doing unit test we are testing logics functions classes that kind of thing okay small unit in the integration test we gather two or more components or two or more uh, parties that is interacting with each other and we do a test on that okay we have component a we have component b and we we get together component a and b and see whether what is going on that kind of thing is integration testing okay and there is vague answers for that okay just just to give you an idea we have like vague uh, vaguely uh, integrating two or more components and testing out whether it is acting as together and the third most one is end to end test okay end to end test is a testing case that we will write uh, throughout the system okay so you, if you have a flow normally when we are doing a software we have a flow we first off we uh, go to a, a software we open the software uh, either it is a browser web based one or desktop based we go to a browser we open the software most of the time if, if there is a login screen we enter the username and password we click uh, login then afterwards uh, say for instance we want to up upload our documents we go to upload section click on the upload button select a file and upload it and go moves forward okay so we do these kind of things we do these kind of activities so we call those things as a, a system interaction or system flow so in order to make sure that whole flow whole section is test we write something called end to end test okay we will be writing end to end test in order to uh, get the full flow working or not okay so we write into end test so we write unit test we write integration test we write into end test so these are like the most common testing mechanisms as a developer should know okay so all of these testing most of the time involve some sort of coding okay if you are running unit test you need to write a code for it uh, if you are write, if you are running uh, if you are writing uh, if you are writing uh, integration test that might include coding if you are writing um, end to end test that is also going to in incorporate some code okay so it's going to be a thing that you should do and you should make sure that is uh, done by as a developer but there are some other tests uh, which are not in 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 terms of uh, handled by uh, handled by what we call the um, developer itself so there are like qa engineers uh, um, who will uh, who will do these things manually okay but remember time goes by all the things uh, will come to an end and you know at least like fewer function will remain like very few function will remain uh, to uh, to uh, what do you call uh, people or manually uh, to be tested out but most of the time everything now will be automated okay so in 20s 
integration unit tests we can cover the application there will be very few uh, different scenarios a qa engineer should work you. okay so make sure uh, we cover everything uh, up when we are developing our application we need to have the um, testing in place in order to work okay so one other thing that we uh, we need to think okay if you are writing unit test we are writing integration test and we are writing um into in test uh, there is what we call something called a testing pyramid okay so there, there is something everybody should know so testing pyramid indicates uh, the proportion of the uh, proportion of the tests that we we'll be introducing to a application okay so let me show you a test pyramid then you guys get an idea and da, da, da. let me share my screen google chrome where is my okay so so you guys can see my screen uh i hope at least yeah so this is uh this is a typical uh, what we call uh, 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 sorry testing pyramid. Okay, so in this testing pyramid, you guys can see that there is unit test, there is integration test, and there is end-to-end -end test. Okay, so unit test and integration test and end-to-end -end test we have discussed in uh, detail what their functionality is by by uh, introducing uh, this testing pyramid we. We propitiate, propitiate the amount of testing that we write within a program. Okay. So the proportion of these things are as seen in here. Unit test, we normally cover, like within, let's say we have 100 uh, test cases to be written. And within that, we will write 60 to 70% of unit test. Okay. So if you have 100 test cases, out of that, 60% or 70%, maybe it's depending on the project, it might be a little bit different. But most of the time, majority, more than 50% of the test cases that we can be writing are going to be unit test. And integration test, it's going to be like 20 to uh, 20 to 15%, that's kind of thing. Okay. So at the end, end-to-end -end tests are having a little portion okay depending on how much these two have taken uh, we need to write end-to-end -end test okay so you guys can see a lot of uh, lot of uh, proportion goes to unit test integration test is a little bit less and end-to-end -end test is even less okay so the pyramid itself you can see the base is huge that's why it is indicating that we give more, uh, more, uh, uh, what do you call the uh, more of the um, application into uh, this, and um, if if we want to give less, um, <laughs> sorry, if we want to give less, uh, less to end to end test, there is a specific reason for that. So why you, we consider more unit test, why we consider less integration into uh, end test? The reason is execution speed, okay? So more you go up in the uh, testing pyramid, the slower a test case getting executed, okay? Since it is an end-to-end -end test, the whole system should be ready to uh, test it out. Okay, if the whole system is not ready, you can't execute a unit test. Maybe at least the test thing flows that you are going with that should be loaded. Okay, so it's gonna take a lot of time to execute an end to end test. That's why we try to keep minimal amount of end to end test within our application. Same goes to integration test. Integration test, yes, we need to combine one or more components and work. So integration can take a little bit of time. That's why we have a fewer amount of integration tests within our application. But on the other hand, unit tests, those are really, really fast. 
okay in, uh, compared to other tests okay since we are going to be testing only a portion or a class function method those kind of small small uh, sections within our application the unit test will be really really fast fast in execution okay so more you more unit test you have it's better okay we have to avoid going up in the pyramid to make sure our code is uh, yes it, it should be tested but we need to make sure if we can cover the things by using a unit test then we should go for it okay not for go and integration test and into end test if there is nothing that we can do okay if there is a certain thing that we can't do then we will go for an end to end test otherwise make sure try to cover up everything in integration and in test okay so make sure you understand the testing pyramid why it is there what is the proportion and what is the execution speed okay that is something you guys should know that's why we are, have introduced the testing pyramid uh, within software engineering okay all right um so with um with that being said what what i'm going to do is um, any questions with the testing pyramid that i need to explain okay not all right what i'm going to do on next lecture i will be explaining how we can write these different kinds of tests but if you are eager to learn i can give you guys some uh, uh, some uh, what do you call uh, learning materials which i have covered uh, even so far but if you are interested we can have a look uh, you can have a prior uh, look into it but if you are uh, if not we can just cover these things up on the next lecture okay so if you guys do not have anything, let me stop recording.